G'day guys and gal. It's honestly a crime against humanity that it's taken me this long to detail the entire lore of the God Emperor of Mankind. Uh, I don't know why I haven't done it, I just I just assumed I had because it's so obvious. Also, a bit of a view gold mine, and whilst I have probably missed the gold rush, I'll just make my own because that's what we do. With lockdown easing in my country, I can also resume my quest to become a custodian and get that video sorted, which will be a lot of fun. Work can also resume on the artistically and classily nude calendars. Sorry, I had to sound pretentious about it. YouTube has been a bit weird lately, age restricting and demonetizing one of my videos, which I would say is quite tame by my standards, but you know, it is what it is. But yeah, good things coming through and major kill stocks have never been higher. Metaphorically, of course, don't touch my stocks, you sneaky little. The God Emperor is the big man of Warhammer 40k. Whilst the rest of humanity is looked down on as a bunch of savages, the God Emperor of mankind inspires awe or fear or both in everyone, no matter how many tentacles they might have. And that is for good reason. Before we get started, another day, another Surfshark sponsorship delivered straight to your cranium. That's right, you guys have been getting so VPN'd up that they paid me to do a third Surfshark plug. Gnarly. Or maybe it's just my charm. Either way, I've come to tell you about the best damn VPN with the best damn discount you'll hear about. For those of you that don't know why you should care about getting a VPN and just want to skip ahead into the video, stop being a Timmy and listen. A VPN is basically like becoming a super spy, allowing you to bypass government firewalls and restrictions in order to access the internet content in different countries. For me, that means I can now watch South Park for free, as well as thousands more Netflix shows. For China, that means being able to access basic human rights. And for Americans, that means you can pretend you aren't American, which by how things are over there at the moment, could be a pretty desirable option. You can do all this international browsing with your identity completely hidden as well, so no chance of getting into a complicated situation. You got it? Good. Now generally VPNs can be pretty expensive, However, with a huge 83% off exclusive Magical discount that you can get by clicking my link below or using my discount code MAJORKILL, the price becomes a total non-issue. That's $2.20 per month for an extremely easy to use and secure VPN. And if you don't like it for some strange reason, then they also have a 30 day money back guarantee. Thank you Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Today we'll go over who the Man Emperor of Mankind is and where he came from. We'll discuss how powerful he is, as well as his current state as a god tier vegetable and how alive and conscious he actually is. I know you probably already know a lot about our golden Skeletor, however there is a lot of confusion and debate out there about him, his knowledge and his motives, so today I'll clear all that up. Let's get into it. The universe of Warhammer 40k is really old. Whilst the Emperor might seem like some kind of supreme being that dunks on the libs left, right and center, there have been characters before him that would be able to knock him off his high horse. He's not even really a god. Heresy! Oh god, not again. After some important self-reflection, I have decided that the Emperor, in his shining golden glory, is the most powerful character to ever exist and is indeed a god. Happy? Yes! Okay, good. Please leave now. Our glorious daddy's story starts in the 8th millennium BC. There was a number of powerful shaman on ancient earth who enjoyed doing their shaman things, such as turning into wolves and howling and, and doing other stuff that I can't talk about until after the 3 minute mark of this video due to YouTube getting really weird recently and threatening my livelihood. Their favorite activity however was reincarnation, which means they could die and come back to life whilst retaining their memories and personalities. Can't blame them, being immortal is a vibe. However, However, as the realms of chaos started perking up a bit over time, this reincarnation process began to suck a lot, as most of the shamans were getting snapped up during their trip in the warp and were suffering from some good old fashioned demonic molestation. I think we are past the 3 minute mark now, so that call should be okay. All the shamans got together and were like, Dirk Bakala, Muhammad Jiha! which was shaman for, ladies and gentlemen, we face a crisis of not only our souls, but the souls of mankind. To combat this new demonic threat, I suggest we all sing Kumbaya, then bash our brains in with a rock. And the wise shaman replied, ah, Durka Durka Durka, which was shaman for, yes, if we all die simultaneously, our souls can merge and form a super bean, which would be really awesome. My only question is, can't we just like OD on some sweet ass psychedelic grass or just jump off a cliff? The whole head bludgeoning thing just seems unnecessary. And to that, the shaman leader was like, SHUT THE FUCK UP GREG! 
don't be a pussy, we're using the rocks. Hence all the shamans beat themselves to death, their souls merging together. Hence the man, who would be known as the god emperor of mankind in the future, was born. But Major Kirill, that origin story of the Emperor is extremely old and outdated. It's probably not even canon anymore. Shut your stupid heretical mouth, Timmy, before I let thousands of shamans go inside you. Sure, it's an old origin story, but as of yet, it has not been retconned or contradicted. As such, that is his current canon origins. If you disagree, then I'll fight you. At his birth and early life, he was called Neoth. But that's a stupid name, so we're going to call him the Big E from now on. He was born in a shitty little village to a boring ass family. As he grew, he began to remember his previous lives, the thousands of them that there were, and his powers also began to materialize. Now, when power comes before wisdom, there is fun to be had. Hence, after his uncle necked his dad, he killed his uncle and left the village to go have a bit of fun. I imagine he was a bit of an egomaniac for a while, and probably plowed an excessive amount of minge. You know, a a lot of people say that the Elder were the cause of Slaanesh's birth, but I reckon the Biggie had a hand in it, after all those benders he would have had. I mean, just look at the man. Whew. I ain't gay, but uh, yeah. Anywho, as the Emperor grew out of this phase, he began to understand his responsibility to guide mankind, and he gave it a good shot, sometimes as a background advisor, and sometimes a little bit more involved. He didn't want to control humanity, only to guide it. This went pretty well for a while bar, you know, a couple world wars and genocides, but you know, can't win all of them. One of the Emperor's many abilities was the power to see potential futures. He knew that although humanity would soon enter into a golden age of space exploration and colonization, it would all come crumbling down. To prepare for this, the Emperor discovered the presence of a large shard of the Void Dragon, which had been chilling out and hiding since Vol kicked it in the nuts. The Emperor grabbed his sword and dragged his big heavy balls to the Void Dragon, and the two fought. The Emperor proved triumphant. It's not really known how, as the Emperor wasn't super duper powerful by this point, and the Void Dragon is the strongest of the Catan, but it's likely due to some Batman tier planning as well as his psychic powers, two things that the Catan aren't really fans of. The Emperor then locked the Void Dragon away deep in Mars. Whilst the Star God slept, its power flowed throughout Mars and gave the Martians increased technological intellect and knowledge, intellect that the Emperor would then go on to leverage in order to conquer the galaxy. Mankind entered into its Golden Age and begun to colonize everything. At this point, the Tau, Necrons and Tyranids weren't a thing, and the Eldar and Mankind didn't really fight. Orcs were also pretty weak after millions of years of the Eldar exterminating them, so it wasn't a very hostile galaxy. Chaos also wasn't really a thing. While this was happening, the Emperor had begun gathering like-minded perpetual scientists to his cause, in order to learn how to bioengineer super soldiers from his base in the Himalayan mountains. He ignored a lot of what was going on, even ignoring the Men of Iron uprising, when mankind's machines turned on them, and ignoring the horrific warp storms that began to appear as the Eldar began murder fucking Slaanesh into existence. The Age of Strife had begun, and mankind had a shit one. However, once human psychers started appearing in the galaxy, the Emperor sprung into action. The presence of psychers meant a growing chaotic power. The galaxy suddenly had a timer on it. The Emperor had to unite mankind and teach the psychers how to use their power for good and not evil. This was proven by the fact that countless human worlds began to die as demons used these untrained psychers as living portals in which they could invade planets from. With the knowledge he had gained himself and the other Perpetuals, the Emperor created the Custodes and Thunder Warriors, super soldiers he could use in order to conquer the now dusty Mad Max-like planet. His warriors smashed through the Techno-Barbarians as more of the planet fell under his command. Whilst the Custodes were perfect, they were hard to create and could never be made in bulk. The Thunder Warriors could, however, they suffered from hectic cancer, as well as small dick syndrome, causing the Thunder Warriors to expire pretty quick and become pretty unreliable. Hence, he worked with his perpetual buddies to create the Astartes, smaller and weaker than the Thunder Warriors, but much more disciplined and didn't go off like a banana left in the sun. After winning one of the final battles for the Emperor, most of the Thunder Warriors were rounded up and gangbanged by the Custodes, who massacred them. This marked one of the first instances of how ruthless and cold the Emperor was. The Thunder Warriors were loyal to the Emperor, and there was likely other solutions on how to deal with them, but ambushing and backstabbing them on the night of their greatest victory was quick, clean, and easy. Some Thunder Warriors did survive, and they staged a rebellion, charging the Emperor's palace, which went about as well as you could expect. 
especially since the Astartes were in full swing by that point, and Cosentine Valdor, a custody so powerful he could likely kill a Primarch in a duel, led the defense. Let's just say the Thunder Warriors got raped with a capital R. With his shockingly cold actions in efficiently conquering Terra, as well as his ambitions being significantly greater than the other Perpetuals initially believed them to be, one by one his allies abandoned him or straight up turned on him, raising their own armies against him. One by one he neutralized them. He did not want to kill them though, hence if a Perpetual was beaten or fled into hiding, he generally left them alone, despite knowing exactly where they were. All of the Perpetuals abandoned him, bar Malkador, who, while he didn't agree with all the Big East choices, wasn't a naive dumbass and knew the Emperor was the best shot humanity had. The gradual loss of the Perpetuals was what drove the Emperor to create the Primarchs. Originally, he was happy to have his immortal buddies as his commanders, but he needed to replace them when they fucked off. Combining his DNA with Erda, the second most powerful Perpetual, as well as making a very questionable bargain with the Gods of Chaos, he was able to create 20 Demigod Super Commanders. He then used those Demigods to create 20 legions of Demi Demigod Super Soldiers, who were the Space Rins we all know and love. Now Erda, like the rest of the Perpetuals, did also turn on the Emperor. For some reason, she thought the Emperor was going to use the Primarchs, her children, as primary school teachers or some retardedly low paying shit like that, instead of the galactic commanders that he had envisioned them as. Hence she allowed Chaos to open up a portal in the baby Primarchs gestation room and then she then tossed all of them into the warp. Great mother she was. Each Primarch's destination was not random though, they all landed on human occupied worlds which suited them greatly, other than Fulgrim and the Khan who was swapped by the Eldar's meme god for a laugh. It could even be said that the Emperor knew this would happen, and allowed it to occur, as he never got revenge on Erda despite knowing where she went into hiding. After all, many of the Primarchs were turned into such legends because of the planets they landed on. Primarchs raised by the Emperor directly could have become too vanilla and basic, lacking the those zealous strokes of genius which won the Imperium so many wars during the Great Crusade. Anywho, with the Primarchs gone, the Emperor began his crusade using his new legions of space marines. He was able to enlist the aid of Mars, who had become a technological powerhouse, as he planned it to, by pretending to be the avatar of their machine god, as he fixed the toaster just by touching it. They granted him a huge fleet of powerful ships. One by one the Primarchs were found, with only Primarch number 2 and 11 being killed by unknown means. It's implied that the Emperor ordered them to be killed as they probably refused to join the Imperium or had buddied up with some Xenos. The humanity clapped the galaxy's cheeks. The Emperor's psychic might though begun to reach its limit, as he was simultaneously leading a crusade while also powering a machine called the Astronomicon, a device which acted as a lighthouse and allowed the Imperium to use the warp. Hence he decided that after a great victory on Ulanor against the Orcs, he would return back to Terra to come up with a permanent solution for mankind's problems with chaos. Now the issue here was that the Emperor believed that ignorance is bliss. He refused to acknowledge chaos and barely told anyone about it. A few of the Primarchs had a pretty good idea about it, and others just thought that Chaos was just a cuddly friend, looking at you there Magnus, but no one really understood how bad Chaos is for your skin. So when the Emperor anointed Horus as the new War Master, and then went back to Terra to work on his solution, no one knew what he was doing. Over a number of years, this perceived lack of trust was a big contributor to the Horus Heresy, aka Magnus definitely fucking did something wrong. What the Emperor wanted to do was open up the Eldar webway for mankind's use. The webway was a series of interdimensional tunnels that the Emperor used for galactic travel. It went through the warp but was protected from it. The Emperor wanted to remove mankind's reliance on the warp for travel, hence slowly starving the Chaos Gods. This was important, as if mankind continued to rely on the warp as more and more psychos were born, demons would have a lot more ways in. By doing this, the Emperor could starve the Chaos Gods and permanently beat them. He also wanted to keep the project secret as the Imperial Navigators, who had built their fortune on warp travel, would likely try sabotage the project, along with Chaos and even the Eldar, who weren't too happy with their webway being taken from them. Eventually, Horus's hair loss, combined with him just being a bit of a little entitled shit, turned him to chaos. 
I guess him getting stabbed with the Chaos Knife also didn't help, but he made the choice in the end. In order to try warn the Emperor of Horus' betrayal, Magnus Astral projected and smashed through the webway to reach the Emperor and warn him. See, Magnus had been banned from Astral projecting or doing any warp spaghetti, as he was being an irresponsible dick about it, and he didn't know what the webway was, only that it blocked him from reaching the Emperor. Let's just say the Emperor wasn't happy that his webway project was now full of holes and being overrun by demons, so he called Magnus an ugly red piece of shit and told him to fuck off. The Emperor deployed the Custodes, Sisters of Silence, and the Mechanicus to the webway in order to try clear it of demons, whilst he sat on the Golden Throne and tried to hold the whole thing together with his powers. But it was useless. Day by day, his forces died as the demons gained ground. With his attention focused on the webway, he wasn't able to go out and deal with Horus and the other traitor Primarchs who had been winning some decisive victories over the Primarchs loyal to the Emperor. Eventually, Horus made it all the way to Terra and sieged the planet. The Emperor was like, all right, enough of this bullshit. So he went into the webway and killed every single demon he could see with a snap of his fingers and a flick of his dick. Then he sealed the webway shut, forever dooming his plans to remove mankind's reliance on the warp. He then told Malkador to sit on the Golden Throne and hold the webway shut whilst he gave Horus the spanking of a lifetime. This was a pretty sad moment, as the Emperor knew that Malkador would not survive sitting on the Golden Throne. It was a very uncomfortable throne. It's more akin to sitting in an Iron Maiden than a seat for an Emperor. The Big E grabbed his two favourite sons, Rogel Dawn and Sanguinius, and took them up to Horus' ship. Unfortunately, Horus wasn't done fucking with everyone, hence he messed up their teleportation, causing our heroes to get separated. Now all the law from here until the Emperor becomes a god tier wheelchair bound battery is subject to change as the last few Horus Heresy books are about to drop and the books have retconned a number of ancient Horus Heresy lore. However, the current law is that Sanguinius finds Horus first and the two fight. Sanguinius, having pretty much carried the loyalist forces in the battle, was exhausted and wounded and Horus, juiced up like a 5 foot 10 roid monkey on Venice Beach, was able to kill him. The Emperor then finds Horus and despite Horus looking evil, sounding evil, killing Sanguinius and, most of all, being bold, couldn't bring himself to kill Horus, hence more or less allowed Horus to beat the shit out of him, losing an eye, an arm, his throat and his spine. It's only when the legendary guardsman Alanis Pius faced off against Horus and got obliterated that the Emperor realised Horus sucked no shit, and decided to blow him up using a soul-destroying Kamehameha. I think the lore in this will be changed though. The Emperor had been set up as this cold, ruthless man that makes sacrifices for the good of humanity. His sudden warm-heartedness and refusal to nuke Horus as soon as he sees him is very jarring and off-character. I have my own theories on what actually happened, which if true, would be the biggest holy shit big balls move from Games Workshop ever. I might cover it in a different video. With Horus dead and the arrival of the Dark Angels, Ultramarines, and Space Wolves, the forces of Chaos are routed and are hunted all the way back to the Eye of Terror. The Emperor is carried to the Golden Throne by Rogel as Malkador turns to dust. The Emperor gives one last decree before entering into a coma and beginning his long and painful job as a battery for the Astronomicon, as well as continuing to hold the webway shut. If that webway door opens, demons will flood Terror and ruin everything. So yeah, know what you want. In his new half-dead state, the Emperor is unsurprisingly not very chatty anymore. Most of his attention is on keeping the Astronomicon lit, so he can't micromanage stuff as much as he used to. As such, the Imperium slowly lost each of its loyalist Primarchs, and the following rulers decided to twist the Emperor's vision and turn everyone from an atheist into devout fanatics. Ironically, this has worked in the Emperor's favour, as all the praise he now gets allows him to access new godlike powers, such as summoning the Legion of the Damned or turning people into Imperial Saints. There are times when he does directly intervene, however. During the Age of Apostasy, Georges Vandaya, that dickhead, ruled the Imperium and nearly caused it to collapse due to how poorly he was running it. The Empress spoke to a sister of battle and basically told her that old mate Georges was fired. Hence, she fired his brain from his skull, saving the Imperium. Another intervention was when a Custodes who was destined for greatness tried to become a companion of the Emperor, basically an elite Custodes who guarded the Emperor forever. However, on his 
final test, the Emperor blocked him and forced him to fail, meaning he was then assigned to important missions out in the galaxy, missions that likely would have failed without him. The Emperor also spoke to Gilliman when Gilliman returned to Terra. Finally, one of the biggest of the Emperor's interventions was when Gilliman was about to fight Mortarion. Morty trapped Gilliman, but then the Emperor possessed some chick and told Morty to suck a fat one, and then he freed Gilliman. So the people that are like, Ugh, the Emperor isn't alive, it's all a myth and propaganda. You can suck my cock. Despite his power, the Golden Throne is failing. Now, I made an entire video about what would happen if the Emperor died or the throne failed. You can see it here. But yeah, it would be pretty bad and something has to happen to prevent it because that's that's where it's trending at the moment. It's unknown what will happen to the Emperor, if he will ever return to a glorious fleshy form or if he will continue to wither away. There is the theory of the Star Child as well, which is probably not canon. Basically, in order for the Emperor to muster up the will to kill Horus, he had to dispel his compassion. This compassion turned into another Emperor called the Star Child, which resides in the warp, and upon the Emperor's death or unification with the Star Child, he will be reborn. This is kind of the plot of text to speech at the moment, but we will need to wait until the next Horus Heresy books until we know if this thing still exists. It seems like at the moment, he doesn't even want to be brought back. Can't really blame him. Fuck dealing with Tyranids. And that does us for today guys, the life and kind of death of the God Emperor of Mankind. Obviously there is more to this story, so I encourage you guys to read up on novels such as The Master of Mankind. But yeah, no one watches me for my length, only my girth. If you enjoyed the video and want to support the channel, the Patreon is the place to be, with only $1 per month giving you access to a boatload of Warhammer Hentai. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more glorious golden content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.